good evening and welcome to today's program. Uh, this program is being organized by Gasa. We are a student group here at ISC. And uh, you can follow us on Facebook, for example. So today we have uh, just uh, two people, two speakers. Sudharva Deshpande and Vijay Prashad. Uh, Sudharva is speaking on theatre and resistance in the leftist context in India. And Vijay uh, Prasad will be discussing the culture and imperialism. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and the climate of anger. So welcome to both the speakers and I will start with you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Always a pleasure being in Bangalore, a special pleasure being here at the Institute of Science. I don't get very many opportunities to be amongst people who are so so, so very smart and you know uh, and so on. I am an artist, I kind of do plays and you know book about a little bit, you know. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about. I am going to be speaking about the work that we do in, in Delhi in a group called Janmati Uh We do basically street theatre. Uh, oops, sorry, I pressed the wrong one. Janakinath is a group that was formed in 1973 but the reason why I am showing you this slide is not to tell you the history of the group but just to point out this little slogan at the, at the bottom right corner People's Theatre Stars the People This is a slogan of the IPTA, Indian People's Theatre Association which was formed in the early 1940s it was part of a very large anti-colonial uh, movement in India and also part of a much larger anti-fascist movement across the world. Right? So, so the work that we do, we see ourselves as being the inheritors of that legacy. In some senses, you know, continuing that legacy, but also doing newer and different things. And some of those things I'm going to be speaking to you about today. There is a very famous English theatre director called Peter Brook. He lives now in France. He's quite old but he's still very active. He's got a seminal book that came out in the 1960s called The Empty Space. Begins with this fabulous first line. It's a great line, right? All you need really for theatre to happen is for one person to be acting, one person to be watching and an empty space. That's the sum and substance of what he's saying here, right? That I can take any empty space and call it a bare stage. A man walks across this empty stage space while someone else is watching him and this is all that is needed for an act of theatre to be engaged. Of course he's right. Of course that's all you need. You don't need all the other stuff that people think of when you think of theatre. It's not essential to theatre. It's fine. It's fine. I'm audible back there. I'm an actor here. So uh, all the other things that you think of when you think of theatre, you think of a building, you think of costumes, you think of sets, lights, makeup, etc., etc. All of that is not essential to theatre. All that is essential to theatre is one person who is willing to act, one person who is willing to watch and an empty space. Right? This was a great book and those of you who, uh, who might be interested in, in questions of this kind, theatre, etc., etc., I would recommend the book highly to you. Having said that, the fact is that there is no empty space. Now look at this picture for instance. What does your eye go to? Unfortunately the resolution here is not very good. It's slightly out of focus. Can we get this in focus? Is that possible? So, anyway, it's alright. Uh, the eye goes to the statue on top, right? And we all know what that statue is. Whose statue is that? <coughs> Ambedkar. It's B. R. Ambedkar, right? The moment you see a statue like that in a locality when you go to perform, like we do all the time in Delhi and around Delhi mostly, what can you say about that locality? What does that statue tell you about that locality? It's a Dalit locality. It's a Dalit locality, obviously, right? And that statue is not just a statue, it's a mark of assertion, right? It's a claim to space, but not just physical space, but other kinds of spaces as well, right? Social space, a space of dignity, 
where human beings can live with dignity, right? And it seems to me that actually if you think about it, there's no space anywhere that's actually empty. There's no space that is that has been evacuated of contestations. Every space, even this campus, every space, any space, there's no empty space. So when we go and do our street theatre, we are not performing in an empty space, in a neutral space. There are no neutral spaces. What we have to do when we do our street theatre is to engage with the politics of the space and the politics of the, the histories, the long histories of contestations that have marked every space. So whether we go and perform in a working class basti in Delhi or whether we go and perform in a village or whether we go and perform in front of a, uh, um, um, of a middle class like a LIC office for the workers there, you know, a white collar workers or whether we go and perform in a school or if we get invited which sometimes happens to an art festival, a theatre festival, all of these spaces are contested spaces. And we have to learn to engage with these spaces. This is also one space. This is a, a, a place called Jhandapur, which is just outside Delhi in Ghaziabad. This performance is a particularly charged performance. This is uh, on the 4th of January 1989. And why is this so charged? Why is this, this space and this performance? a piece of history. It's because of this man, Saftar Hashmi. Saftar and uh, Saftar was one of the founder members of Jannatimach, the group that I'm speaking about, the group that I belong to. We had gone to perform in Jhandapur on the 1st of January, 1989. We were attacked there, physically attacked. Our play was attacked. And in that attack, Saftar was killed as well as a <coughs> migrant worker from Nepal called Ram Bahadur. He was shot dead. Sardar was badgered on the head and he died the next day in hospital. So Sardar, the, the attack happened on the 1st of January. Sardar died on the 9th of the 2nd, late night on the 2nd. On the 3rd of January was his cremation and it was a massive funeral procession of 15,000 people. Remember this is way before social media, way before you know, um, internet, cell phones, etc, etc. People came at a time when people, many people, even in the middle class, didn't even have landlines in their homes, right? 15,000 people came uh, to protest, essentially. The next day, on the 4th of January, in the morning, we returned to Jhandapur and we performed the play that had been interrupted. In this, uh, uh, in the previous picture, uh, you see four actors, uh, there's Subhash Tyagi, there's Jogi, there's Brijender Singh and there's Madhoi Shri Hajpi. Madhoi Shri uh, has been our comrade, she's been a leader of Tannatimaj for many many years. She and Sabdar met as part of the movement and at some point they fell in love and got married and so on. And she's the one who led us to get back to Jhandapur on the 4th of January in what really has become in a sense a uh, uh, a historic, iconic performance. It's gone down in the history of Indian theatre, not just Indian street theatre. Um, and it rallied a large number of people across the country. Those of you who are slightly older will remember those days maybe in 1989. Across the country, there were protests that happened in several cities. Thousands of people came up. I'm not trying to suggest that there was something special about Jannat per se that led to so many people protesting. There were many, many factors that went into it. Remember this is 1989, the BOFO scandal is happening, you know, uh, the Congress is going to lose the election soon, uh, etc. All of that is going to happen later in the year, right? So there's a lot of anger already that's, that's, that's simmering. In one sense, after the emergency, it was hoped that we had beaten back the authoritarian tendencies of the Congress. It was clear that that was not the case. It was clear that we, uh, that the Congress had not lost its authoritarian uh, sort of strong fist, right? And all of that, as well as student politics and so on and so forth, there's a lot, right? All of that comes to a head in this one particular, 
in, in this one moment when people feel this is too much how can a man be killed for the act of performing the play now of course if you think about it it seems like oh you know not very far from here we have had the murder of kalburgi right we have had the murder of pansare comrade women pansare and uh, and taborka right in maharashtra etc so so now we don't think of these as really shocking things anymore they don't shock us so much but in 1989 it did create an impact it shook people up now <clears throat> the point that sadar kept making throughout his life and all of his writings and when he spoke to us etc he was only 34 when he died unfortunately and in my view sadar was kind of poised for a very very big leap forward creatively politically organizationally and so on when uh, when he was killed one of the points that he kept making to us all the time is to say that look don't think of art as something that happens outside of society don't think of art and the artist as somehow exalted as living above this idea of the genius artist who sits at home thinks up something really fabulous etc that's why in in the theater for instance we have the notion of the premiere you know the premiere performance what's the idea behind the premiere performance that the artist who's a genius has created something behind closed doors nobody has access to rehearsals even now in many many uh, theaters in the west you can't just walk into a rehearsal right that's totally opposite to what happens in let's say in a lot of folk performances in india or in the kind of theater that we do we hold open rehearsals anybody can walk in walk out whatever we don't care right but the idea that this genius artist has created something and on the day of the premiere it's going to be you know unveiled this genius work is going to be unveiled you see this whole idea is something that we find completely uh, alien to us we don't think of our work like this we think of our work as having come from the people and going back to the people in a sense we think of our work as being we think of ourselves as being kind of intermediaries between the people themselves actually right the the title of my talk comes from a a, a, a book uh, uh, by john berger the famous marxist uh, from britain uh, who also lived in france uh, and who died recently shape of a pocket in that one of the points that he makes is that the role of the artist has to be re-envisioned we have to see the artist as not being somebody who sits above and apart from society but somebody who belongs to society takes from society and gets back to society reformed and reshaped and i want to talk a little bit about some of the ways in which we reshape material that we find from society and give back especially to the fighting classes which is why it's very important for us to work in in close contact with organizations we don't believe that we make a play we take that play somewhere people watch the play and suddenly boom you know something changes people change no we don't believe that social change happens like this there's a there's a ton of things that happen to make social change right and amongst those things the the role of organizations that organize struggling people people who are struggling to make ends meet people who are struggling to live a life of dignity right organizations that organize these people are very important to make social change so we see our theater as being in service of this large process of social change this large movement for social change we don't see ourselves as going there and suddenly changing things by you know by doing one play etc uh, which is why in almost every performance that we do you will see organizers with us in this in this photograph you can see the red flag there that's the flag of the CITU that's a, a center of indian trade unions is the largest left wing trade union organization in the country we work a lot with CITU about 60% of our shows in a year and we end up doing about 200 to 250 performances a year right about 60% of those performances happen with either the CITU or the all india democratic women's association ADWA we also work with students etc 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 but we also work with 
uh, organizations that may not be seen as being political in the conventional sense, like residents, welfare associations, etc. You know, <coughs> or sometimes school teachers, you know, college teachers, and so on. <coughs> the previous slide that I showed you is of a play called Machine. This was our very first street play. This was done in 1978. And the idea behind machine is really quite simple, which is that five actors come together, they form a machine, and one by one they step out of the machine and explain what their, what their role is in this machine. This machine is of course capitalism, right? So one of them is the capitalist, there are three workers, and there's the security guard. And the, and the point being made in a very short 12, 13 minute pithy uh, piece, the point being made really is that this relationship between capital and labor is not a, a, a simple democratic voluntary relationship. It's a relationship that has to be mediated through force, right? And that at some point, this machine is going to stop working. At some point, this machine will break down. And when the sutradhar says, what happened? Why did this machine break down? What? Who's done this? One worker steps out and says, I've done it, right? <coughs> It's a beautiful play, it's about 12-13 minutes long uh, and, and after having done this play, we've done a whole lot of plays on, on issues that concern the working class. Uh, this is a more recent play and this came out of really a whole lot of interviews that we did with workers across Delhi. Delhi and, I mean by Delhi I mean NCR really. Not just strictly speaking Delhi, but Gurgaon, Noida, etc., in Ghaziabad, and so on. And one of the things that came out in these interviews, these interviews were really done in 2008 or so, roughly. Uh, and one of the things that came out in these interviews is across the across the various industrial areas. One of the things that workers kept saying to us is that you know, comrade, uh, the older the 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 older Malik's that's the, the older capitalists used to be different, the new guys are different. And when you say, what is the difference? Is it that the older guys were nice and the new guys are not nice? That's not how they would articulate the difference. But really what they articulated for us was a kind of a cultural difference, right? It's not that the older people were very generous, etc., etc., or less exploitative and so on. No, but the difference was really cultural that the new guys, especially sons of the older guys. Uh, so as one of the workers said, Aray sir, ye log jo hai Australia, Australia jate hai, wahan se MBA wagara karke aate hai, unko lagta hai ke Hindustan mein bhi Australia chalai hai. You know, that we we'll do Australian sort of methods in India and so on. And so, and so we worked on this play and developed a play in which the central character is actually two characters. One is the father, that's, that's the guy you see on the left, uh, who's an older type of capitalist, he's a Lala, you know, so he comes with his big belly, with a cap, the Lala's cap, or, you know, uh, uh, a thing and so on, and his whole manner is an old world manner, right? And, and he goes away and his son comes, of course played by the same actor, which is what brings a lot of humor into the play. It's a moment of, you know, dramatic surprise. Uh, to see the same actor now suddenly being, you know, coming, yo, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean, yeah, yeah, you know, that kind of stuff, right? So, so it's funny and so on. But the idea really is to try and take from the people and give back to the people what they tell you, try and process it in a creative way. We've also done a whole lot of plays, as I said, on women's issues. And one of the plays that I very briefly want to talk to you about is this play called Go Boluthi. Normally when we talk about women's issues, we talk about gender issues, we talk about patriarchy, about violence and so on, then it gets articulated in certain ways. For instance, the idea that, you know, the, the girl child is not allowed to study or, you know, dowry at the time of marriage or let's say domestic violence or rape, etc., etc. And of course we've done plays on all of these things. Right? But we did want to do one play which would not talk about any of these things, but would really talk about the culture of patriarchy, would talk about all those things that we don't recognize as patriarchy, but that we see every day in our daily lives.
The play is really a, it's a triptych of three stories. The first story is about a young girl who, who comes from a, a working class family. Her mother, her father is a factory worker. Her mother goes at, at, as domestic labor to work in somebody's house. When the mother falls ill, she has to go and substitute on her mother's uh, behalf. One day she goes there and, and you know those guys are, it's a nice family. Right? They're not horrible and so on. So this family gives her these red ribbons which have come for a dance performance of the daughter of the family. The dance performance is over. She doesn't want the ribbons anymore. Achha, tu le de. So his bachi ko ye ribbon jo hai de diya jate hai. And, and this, this kid comes back home with the ribbons and all that she wants to do is to tie the ribbons and play with them. You know, and she doesn't get the chance to do it all day. Something or the other keeps interrupting them. Till at the end of the day, after her parents have gone to sleep, everyone has gone to sleep, in that little shack that they live in, she goes in front of the mirror and turns on the light and puts on the ribbons. And that's when the father gets up and says, what the hell is this? I need some sleep. And she says, no, I'm going to tie my ribbons. Wo bolo ki. The third story in the, uh, in the triptych is about a woman worker in a factory and they're trying to form a union in the factory. So they talk about, you know, what are the issues that the union should take up? How should we do this? How should we do that? Etc. Etc. One of the women stands up and says, I also have a demand. You have to include it in the charter of demands. They say, what is it? She says, I want a separate toilet for women. And everyone is like, what? Is that even a demand? Like, what kind of demand is that? How stupid. We are talking about, you know, important things like minimum wage and, you know, dearness allowance and pension and this, that, new machines and so on and so forth. You are talking about some stupid toilet? What is this? This woman insists. She's a young woman. She insists. She says, no, this is a very important demand. You don't understand how important a separate toilet is for us women. Right? And she, and she basically breaks the unity of the workers on this issue. She forces the workers, including the leadership of the union, she forces the leadership of the union to have a vote on this issue and finally wins the vote. Again, coming out of stories that we see all around ourselves, all the time, these are really inspired by stories that we have heard from workers. The, uh, the third play that, or the fourth play I want to quickly talk to you about is a play called Yedin Mangi Mor Guruji. This is something that we first evolved in response to the violence in Gujarat in 2002. Uh, I don't need to tell you the history of all of that. Uh, the people who perpetrated that violence or at least who sat on the top while the violence was being perpetrated are today very, very important people in our country. I don't necessarily need to name them, etc. Right? Uh, as the violence began, as soon as the violence began, there was the sense that we had that something has changed. This is a decisive moment in the history of the Republic. This is something really critical. We had had the same feeling in 1984. We had had the same feeling in 1992 at the time of Babi Masjid. And again in, in 2002, literally, I'm telling you, literally the conversations that happened in rehearsals, as soon as we heard of the, uh, of the Godra, uh, you know, train burning and, uh, and the deaths and so on. And we sat there in fear, you know, trembling with fear and saying, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? And within days, it was clear what was going to happen. Gujarat was burning, right? And we said, we can't keep quiet now. We have to do something. But how do you respond to something like this? All along, we've done a ton of plays on, uh, on the issue of sectarianism, communism, and so on. And every time, the play has had essentially the same message, which is, that the masses, whether Hindus or Muslims, are essentially secular, right? It's the communalist leaders who come and divide the people. So the people must be must beware of leaders and form a unity of the people. Hindu, Muslim, bhai, bhai, or whatever it is, however you want to say. <coughs> but we felt that what was happening in Gujarat was was fundamentally different. This was not a sectarian riot. This was not a communal riot, right? It, there is no sense of an equivalence here of the violence. It's a one-sided, state-sponsored, state-backed pogrom against the Muslims. 
And if we frame this whole issue as being Hindus against Muslims, we really lose the plot. <coughs> What's happening in Gujarat is not about that. What's happening in Gujarat actually has its history in a much longer struggle. That's the struggle that, that starts in the early 1920s or thereabouts, when the RSS and the Hindu Mahasabha are formed. Right? That's really about an idea of India. What is India going to be after independence? Is it going to be a secular democratic republic or is it going to be a, 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 a religious Hindu Rashtra? Right? That's what is at stake. If, if today a Hindu Rashtra were to come into being, this is not only against Muslims. A Hindu Rashtra is something that militates against all of us. And so therefore, the play that we came up with is a play that kind of plays with different registers of language. One register of language is silence. So the play begins with silence. Complete silence. Nobody says a word. And we come with images and words on placards. The second register is poetry. Very angry poetry. Uh, excellent, beautiful poetry that got written at that time. For instance, one of the poem goes, Aapka swagat is jalte hue aur shishay ki tarah har roz thoda pigalte hue is marte hue aur marne se pehle thoda pani maangte hue shahir mein aapka swagat hai. So, you know, the second register was anger and poetry. The third register was perfunery. So what you have here is the guy in the middle is the guru <coughs> and he is on a journey to refashion India into a Hindu Rashtra. Right? He has two sort of sidekicks. One is Bhuttibali and that's the woman on the, on the left and the other is Bahubali. That's the guy on the right. Yeah? And the three of them Bhuttibali, Bahubali and Guruji. The three of them have to be seen as, in a sense, the way you see, let's say, Thakur, Jai and Viru in Shodhi. Right? It's one unit. Right? These are not three different characters. It's one unit. It's like, it's like the armless Thakur of Shodhi. Right? He doesn't have arms, no? In Shodhi. And Jai and Viru are his two arms. Yeah? So similarly, here, of course, the RSS has arms. And these are the two arms of the RSS. So that's how, but it's a hilarious <clears throat> sequence, completely over the top, and so on. Uh, what this what this play actually taught us, really, and we had been doing street theatre for a very long time before that. But what this play really taught us is that one of the things that street theatre does is that it humanizes us. It enables us to have conversations because it makes us angry and it makes us laugh and it makes us think all at the same time right in that so-called empty space which is not an empty space actually you bring in something that changes something but <clears throat> all these years that we have done street theater for over 40 years we have never been actually attacked by somebody who's watched a play we've been attacked many times and not just we many other groups across the country have been attacked many times physically attacked, you know, but in none of these cases has an attack happened after spectators have seen a play got angry and attacked, no. The people who attack don't watch our plays, they are not interested, right? But the people who watch our plays, they may get very angry with us, they may tell us, oh you are biased, you are anti-Hindu, you are this, you are that, etc, 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 whatever it is, they don't attack us. And that's interesting to me. What it does is, it creates a possibility of dialogue. It creates the possibility of saying that, okay, let's listen to what each of us has to say. And we can speak to each other without bashing each other's heads in. It, it's, it's a kind of a rehearsal of democracy. Because democracy is not just a political you know, system where we go and vote every five years. That has no meaning if there is no democracy on the street if there is no democracy in the home, if there is no democracy in educational institutions and so on and so forth. Street theatre, in my view, works because it, it trains us in this everyday practice of democracy. I just want to very quickly go through some other slides which is really about uh, the work that we have done with the Palestinian group. 
um, and and before I go to the uh, the work that we've done with the Palestinian group and, and speak about the group etc., I thought it would be useful for us to get some little glimpse of life in Palestine. I don't know how many of you have been to Palestine or any occupied military zone, right? I had the opportunity to go to go to Palestine and I'd like to share with you a couple of stories of what I saw there. This is the village of Atwani. It's in the South Hebron Hills. Every day in the evening there's a game that children play that the, that the children play in this village. We are standing right now when I'm standing uh, while I took this photograph is with my back to Atwani. On the other side of the hill you can see those houses, those white dots are houses. That's an Israeli settlement on land stolen from Palestinian villages, in this case Atwani. There's a road that snakes between the two. That's the unofficial boundary. Where my arrow is pointing, you can't see it in, in this resolution, but where my arrow is pointing, there's a little jeep. It's an army jeep that goes down that road every hour and a half or so. As soon as the army jeep goes down, there are these children who are between the ages of about 8 to 15, 16, you know, <coughs> who are waiting, hiding, right? As soon as the army jeep goes by, they dart across, right? Across to the side of the settlement. What they have with them is a kind of a, 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 a plastic sack, right? The bora, yeah? And they have these big scissors. Now, they are, they are masters at camouflage. Now in this picture, unfortunately, you, even if you came close, you wouldn't be able to make out that there are many kids here. I have only circled one of them. Yeah, There's a circle on the left hand side, can you see? In the middle of that circle is a kid. I repeat this picture. All of those circles are kids. Yeah, And you can't see them because they wear clothes that kind of blend into the thing. They crouch, they run and so on. It's, it's amazing to see, it's amazing. And so they run, and they run right up to the settlement, up to the, the, the fence of the settlement. What they're doing is, there's a certain cactus that grows in this area. This cactus has a flower. In the middle of that flower, there's this little thing that has a juice, sweet juice in it. So for that one or two drops of juice, that's the game. So you, you, know, you don't want the cactus, you don't want that little thing that gives you one or two drops of sweet juice. Right? So, so they dart across, they don't have the time to pluck out that part, so they cut the whole cactus, stuff their, their boras with, with the cacti and dart back before the jeep comes. Because if the jeep comes, then of course they can be caught, they can be shot, they can be imprisoned, they can be accused of mounting an armed attack against unarmed Israeli citizens. I was there on this hilltop <coughs> for over two hours watching these kids. And I swear to you, my heart was in my mouth all throughout. <clears throat> all over Palestine, there are camps. These are camps of the internally displaced. These are people who have been displaced in 1948. They can't anymore go back to their own villages in Haifa, in Akka, in, you know, etc., etc., in Israel, right? So they are internally displaced within Palestine. Uh, the, the, the key is a very important symbol. A lot of these families that were internally displaced actually carry the key to their homes even now. Old twisted big keys. And the key has become a symbol of the right to return in, in a free Palestine to their villages. This is what a camp looks like. It does not look like what you would imagine a camp to look like. But of course it's a camp that's been there for 70 years. right? So obviously it's not going to be tents. Right? People have built up homes and so on. I come from Delhi and these kind of water tanks, these black water tanks, you know, is something that I'm very used to. I see them in Delhi all the time. One of the ways in which you can distinguish an Israeli and a Palestinian house in a place like Jerusalem, for instance, where they can be cheek by jaw, is by looking at the roof. If it has a tank, it's a Palestinian house. If it does not have a tank, it's an Israeli house. Israeli houses get piped water 24 uh, hours. There's the wall, the famous apartheid wall. When this wall was built, 
we are on this side of the camp, on that side is an Israeli settlement. Right? This, this land has been stolen even from the camp. Yeah? When the wall was built, at that time there was one house that remained on the other side of the wall. That's how the wall was built. Right? And they thought, the Israelis thought, oh, you know, we've built the wall, this one Palestinian family has been isolated. Well, of course, they'll just leave and go. Right? Who's going to live there? This family continued to stay there, facing weekly attacks. Some of those attacks I'll describe to you. One night at 3 o'clock, there are several jeeps and SUVs that turn up there. Israeli settlers step out, they have automatic weapons and they start firing in the air and they start firing at the water tanks and they let loose dogs who go and attack the house and scratch at the doors and you know, uh, are screaming and shouting and so on. This is a house that has children in it. Another attack, there are about 50 snakes are let loose um, near the house right? and so on. These are attacks that they face on a daily basis. When I went there, this family had been living there for nine years. Checkpoints. All over Palestine there are checkpoints. And I saw some of the most incredibly moving uh, uh, things uh, at this checkpoint that I was a part of. This sign, by the way, is a sign that says that going into area A in the West Bank is illegal for Israeli citizens. And it's actually you can be prosecuted. If you're an Israeli citizen and you go into the West Bank, you can be prosecuted for that crime, for going into Area A. Uh, <clears throat> that's what the checkpoint looks like. We are standing there for about an hour and a half. We don't know when the checkpoint will open. There's no information, there's no sign, there's no timing, there's nothing. Right? We're just standing there not knowing, well, it might open, it might not open, etc. Palestinians are, are probably the world's heaviest smokers. Everybody smokes in Palestine all the time, at least the main people. And so while we are standing there, I see this one guy who, whose arms, both his arms are heavily plastered, bandaged, right? So he can't use his fingers and so on. And he's standing there like that. A part of his face has also been kind of blown away. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a moving sight to see him. And he's standing there like that. You know, in two, three minutes, somebody goes up to him who doesn't know him not even looking at him, there's no conversation, there's nothing, all of this is happening silently. You know, goes up to him, lights a cigarette and puts it in his mouth. So this guy takes a few puffs and so on, they share a cigarette, a few more puffs and so on. That's it, finished. No thank you, would you like, you know, no nothing. Next, somebody else goes there, opens a bottle of water, you know, offers him some water. And so on, this keeps happening for an, for an hour and a half. There's another older man who needs to go to the hospital clearly. He's standing there with his drip in his hand, right? And it's still sort of going into his veins, right? And he's standing there and every, literally every two or three minutes, somebody goes up and takes that, that pouch from him. And they keep rotating this. Nobody says a word. They're all having different conversations. But nobody says a word about any of this. Um, <clears throat> Just very quickly, the theatre that I work with is called uh, the it's called the Freedom Theatre, and uh, these two men that you see holding babies are two of the founder members of this theatre. The guy on the left is a guy called Giuliano Mertamis. Uh, he was one of the founders of the theatre in 2006. In 2011, he was assassinated outside the theatre. The other person that you see in the picture is a man called Zakaria Zubedi. He was a militant and armed combatant uh, who gave up arms um, and, and became one of the founder members of the theatre. I was very fortunate to have also met him. Uh, we had the opportunity to see the Freedom Theatre uh, and then to be able to bring students of the Freedom Theatres, eight students, uh, two, uh, six students and two teachers down to India and work with them. Uh, in a play that was called Hamesha Samida that toured about 11 cities including Bangalore. This is from our performance in, uh, in Delhi. This is from our performance in Bhopal. And then we had the opportunity also of going to Palestine and, and doing our own play in Hindi there. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have the time to uh, expand on the play and, and our experiences there. If you're interested, we can get back to it. Um, uh, in the Q&A. But I do want to end with this, 
with this last thought that one of the things that street theatre also does is that it gives strength and hope to people who fight. There's a, there's a concept in Palestine, sumud, the concept of steadfastness that I will not let go, you know. That's the concept that is, uh, that is contained in this poem, a beautiful poem by Papazia. Here we will stay, we shall remain like a ball upon your chest and in your throat like a shard of glass, a cactus thorn and in your eyes a sandstorm. In Lega and Brahma and the Galilee, we shall remain, guard the shade of the fig and olive trees, ferment rebellion in our children like yeast in the dough. Thank you very much. Hello, nice to be here. Uh, maybe shift gears a little bit. My presentation is much more boring than Susan was. a little schematic story perhaps no need I think it's okay you can also come in front lots of space I don't have to yell when you need to use a mic okay I'm going to just try to explain a little bit uh, through providing perhaps a little framework of um, the age of anger you know how we've entered what Pankaj Mishra calls the age of anger Pankaj's book is very good it, it uh, describes the emergence of people like Modi Erdogan in Turkey and anticipates uh, Donald Trump's victory in the United States also the hard right in Europe and let's not forget the very hard right winning in Japan you know we forget that Shinzo Abe is a very far right politician whose grandfather was a war criminal and interestingly enough Shinzo Abe's grandfather led a team of Japanese war criminals later designated as war criminals whose mission was to kill Kim Il-sung who was fighting in uh, the northern part of Korea. It's so interesting that Shinzo Abe now, uh, the grandson of that war criminal, is head to head against the grandson of Kim Il-sung. But the far right moves from the United States at one, you know, there are dynasties everywhere in the world. We, we don't think of Shinzo Abe as the grandson of this war criminal, but there are dynasties all over. Um, so from one end, the United States to Japan on the other, the far right is really in ascendancy. We don't really have a good Marxist theory of why the far right uh, has emerged. You know, we understand emotionally there's something wrong here. We hope very much that they'll somehow fall on their own. You know, but these things don't happen. Uh, we need to understand how they arise in order to understand how to defeat them. So I'm going to provide for you a preliminary framework that I've been trying to think through about why I think uh, this is the age of anger and why the far right has emerged. So the first thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is the concept globalization. I'm going to share perhaps four concepts, maybe five, four concepts very quickly, very schematically, so we can understand a little bit, put a framework uh, to understand why the age of anger has emerged. The first concept is globalization. Now we know that capitalism as a social system, as a global social system, has a tendency to immiserate workers, to create, uh, let's say, inequality, to create pockets of poverty, etc. At the same time, capitalism has a tendency to displace labor by machines. You know, it favors mechanization. In fact, these are two chapters in Marx's Capital, the chapter on the working day, which is on the tendency to immiserate, and the chapter on the machine, which is the tendency to displace human labor by machines. And we see this happening in our everyday life. You know, how rarely we go into a bank now and talk to a teller. We use ATM machines. You know, machines have become ubiquitous. You need to book a train, you go to your computer. You don't go and talk to a human being anywhere. So machines are displacing human labor and on a global scale, immiseration is happening through unemployment. Structural, mass, immense problems of unemployment. But that we know is a general tendency in capitalism and has been so 
for the last 180 odd years. The statistics bear this out. You can see this in reports from the International Labour Organization. You can see this in statistics, very good statistics produced by the UN uh, Conference on Trade and Development. That's UNCTAD. Lovely reports. The analysis is often neoliberal, but the material is very good. So I recommend if you're interested in this to look at these reports. That's what I use uh, when I try to understand these issues. Now globalization was an interesting phenomena. It relied on four or five different important developments. The first development it relied upon was to break down uh, the barriers set up after perhaps the Russian Revolution and then eventually after decolonization. So to break down the barriers of the third world states, the kind of autarkic national development models, these had to be torn down. These were often torn down uh, through the process of the debt crisis. And I don't have time to get into how the debt crisis uh, you know, developed in the 1980s, but they basically made these countries surrender their sovereignty through later what was known after 1981 as structural adjustment programs produced by the International Monetary Fund. So third world you know, nationalism basically was destroyed through the debt crisis. These countries faced a short-term debt, which the IMF utilized as an instrument uh, to make them structurally adjust their economic policies, their social policies, cultural, and various other domestic and sometimes international policies. So the first thing was the third world project had to be wrecked. The second thing was by the late 1980s and early 1990s, the entire Eastern Bloc collapsed. And so when the Eastern Bloc collapsed and the Berlin Wall falls, and when the, uh, so, uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union essentially you know, commits suicide, really, I mean, the Soviet Union collapsed because the Communist Party basically closed down. Uh, we have a book coming out from Left Road called Red October, and the central essay is by Prakash Karat. He, he wrote this essay in 1991. It's a terrific essay about how the Soviet Union's Communist Party essentially collapsed upon itself. It was not external pressure, it was because they basically set aside Marxism, they set aside all their understandings of the world and basically committed suicide. I mean, I've said this three times, I just want to bang that in. The, the third, so, so that the entire uh, continent of Eurasia, but for China, by 1991, had delivered labor to international capital. The third world had delivered labor to international capital, welcoming foreign direct investment, and the Soviet and Eastern European blocs delivered labor to Western capitalism, to global capitalism. Eastern European workers would migrate to Britain where they would bother the British workers and later you'd have Brexit. I said all of Eurasia but China. The following year in 1992, the Chinese would deliver their workers to international capital. That's when you have the new policies emerge in Shenzhen, free trade zones uh, in the southern China rim, and the entry of so-called Singapore policies uh, into the Chinese economic model. So by 1992, all the world's labor was delivered to global capital. The second thing that happened was some major technological developments in communications and transportation. Transportation, you move now to containerized ships, which meant you could move goods much faster across the globe than you could before. Secondly, communication technology is very much improved through satellite communication, through computerization. So databases could have, uh, databases and it broke the time-space continuum. You could be playing on a database here and somebody in San Jose could be doing this, working on the same database at the same time. So time and space basically smashes. But this is very important because what it meant was firms now, global monopoly firms, could use labor anywhere across the planet Earth. Labor which had seen its globalization in a minimal way. In other words, capital could, ex could basically source labor anywhere but labor, because of immigration controls, was restricted to certain containers. So capital became free to source labor. Labor was not free to seek capital. So what that meant was, of course, that capital, if it could read signals in small differences in labor prices, what's known as labor arbitrage, it could take advantage of labor arbitrage. But labor couldn't decide, well, look, you know, I, there are too low wages in India. I'm now going to go and you know, work in Europe. So you'd have to go illegally, you couldn't go legally. If you went illegally, you'd have to now accept suppressed wages because you didn't have documents. So capital was able to source labor, but labor was not able to freely move uh, to higher rates of wages. So labor arbitrage becomes an important issue. Because of that, because of this technological development, and because of communication, and because these countries' political sovereignty was weakened in this period, firms could disarticulate, which meant that 
Rather than build a giant factory in one place, you could build six or eight factories to make parts of a commodity in six or eight places. What this also meant was that the firms themselves were not investing in the making of factories. So, you know, a company like Microsoft or Apple is the best example. Apple doesn't actually make anything. Apple sits back and says, we've designed a computer. Who can make a printed circuit board? And Foxconn says, we'll do it. So Foxconn then will take the risk of investment. They will invest their capital to build a factory. They'll hire labor. They'll get parts, etc. Microsoft has taken no risk in this process. Foxconn takes the risk. There's another company in India which is competing against Foxconn. And here there's dog-eat-dog -dog competition. And Microsoft says, well, now I prefer the Indian company. Now I prefer Foxconn back and forth, tweedledee, tweedledum. And the two of them competing against each other. This is free market ruthless capitalism at this level. And it's a race to the bottom for those workers. Meanwhile, Microsoft is a monopoly firm. It's not competing against anybody. So capitalism has this uneven topography now. There are these firms that are called sort of supersized firms, Microsoft, Apple, Nike shoes, you know, etc., etc., etc. They make mass commodities, but they basically... Now, in order for them to protect their, um, uh, their authority over the global, uh, you know, uh, international uh, economic and accumulation system, in order for them to control this, two things are very important. The first thing was they had to find a way to protect the intellectual property rights. Which is why, just about at the same time, in the lead up to the World Trade Organization's founding in 1994, they pushed for a shift in intellectual property rights law. So we moved from process-based patenting to product-based patenting. That was called TRIPS, and there was a side agreement called TRIMS. TRIPS is important. What it meant was, you know, all of you are so smart, work in the Institute of you know, Science, you know how to develop things. Probably 25 years ago, there were people here who take apart a camera like that, take it apart, see how it works, and then reverse engineer it. And then you could patent the process that you came up with and produce cameras. Now, even if you reverse engineer that camera and make the same camera, you have to pay the company rent if you try to manufacture it and sell it. Because they've patented the product, not the process. Process patenting is much more democratic. Because it means, especially in pharmaceuticals, you can come up with the same medicine in a different way. Product patenting is completely befitting of monopoly capitalism. If you have a patent on the product, nobody else can produce it without paying you rent. So they were able to establish that, and that was the first way they were able to secure, through a kind of extra legal power, because patents are extra legal power, they were able to secure, in a sense, um, the right to their product, which is made by others around, around the world. The second thing they needed was secure sea lanes because you're moving goods all across the world to finish them in a third, fourth, fifth country. You also need to ha have the ability to make sure that these countries that for now have their political sovereignty compromised don't start to stand up for themselves. And so here comes the importance now of the old Cold War bases. And here comes imperialism. It's so interesting that in this period, the literature on imperialism and the word imperialism begins to disappear. People don't use the word imperialism. You use it, you sound kind of silly. People look at you as if you're anachronistic. In fact, this was part of the cultural agenda in a way to get us to stop using the word imperialism, to start thinking of globalization as a flattening of the world. So Thomas Friedman used uh, Nanda Nilikani, I think it was Nil Nilikani's phrase, the world is flat, as the cover of his book. They were playing golf somewhere, and I think Nilikani said to him, you know, now the world is flat. Which is interesting because this is a, a return to the pre- uh, what is it? Who was it who said the world is round? Copernicus. Somebody, I don't know, whoever it was, said the world is round, you know, the, and the church said, no, it's flat. So here we are, a return to the old church teaching that the world is flat. But what they meant was there is no uneven power relations between north and south. There is no imperialism. It was a way to flatten power relations and suggest that globalization meant everybody was equal. Remember, I already said, that capital could source labor freely, but labor can't move around. That's a good indication that the world is not flat. The second indication is there was American ships, basically, that go through the Straits of Malacca alongside Indian ships, alongside Singaporean ships, to basically put pressure on the Chinese. Or it's American ships in the Straits of Hormuz. You know, there are no Iranian ships that go through the Long Island Sound in the, in the United States or are off the coast of Los Angeles putting pressure on American shipping in their sea lanes.
So the role of uh, basically so-called American unipolarity to manage these trade routes, sea lanes, to manage disobedience from countries, so-called rogue states, plays a role in this. We don't often think about that. Globalization produced a world, as it turned out, with serious problems, increasing inequality and systemic risk, no longer borne by, any, you know, by, by these monopoly firms, but systemic risk defrayed onto small producers, small factory owners, places like Haiti, Dominican Republic, etc., pensioners, people who were on pensions, blue-collar workers, white-collar workers, etc. And we see that now with the IT firings. White-collar workers bearing some of the brunt of this. I'll come back to that in a minute. The first attempt to solve the problems raised by globalization comes through the policy slate known as neoliberalism. So here the idea is interesting. The theory is that you have an elite which, emboldened by globalization, believes that it has won world history, no longer wants to pay taxes, pushes political power to allow it to maintain much of its profits for its own self, and drives a cultural agenda that suggests that it is making money and is therefore entitled to keep its money. You know, that I am an entrepreneur, I made that money, I should be allowed to keep that money, and if I'm charitable, I should be allowed to be philanthropic in my own way. So the entrepreneur becomes the cultural symbol of neoliberalism, whether it's, you know, in India, uh, Azim Premji, it's, you know, I don't know, Nilekani, it's Adani also, you know, Ambani, whoever these people are, they deserve to be very rich because they work hard, they come up with ideas, they are entrepreneurs. You should, rather than be resentful of them, become entrepreneurs like them. If you want to do that, you should go to coaching classes, you should take extra school, you should learn how to speak English in some kind of other school, you know, do these kind of things which are self-help. I was in the airport in Delhi looking for a book. I mean, there were spirituality books that went on forever, and then there were self-help books. I didn't see any books explaining the economy. You know, that's irrelevant. Even the memoirs of the philanthropist entrepreneur are basically spirituality and self-help. You know, they tell you how they found God, and they tell you how they did it. You know, they worked hard. They don't tell you they inherited their wealth. They don't tell you they bribe politicians. They don't tell you that their money is in the Panama somewhere. They don't tell you that, you know, they put pressure on Mr. Modi, etc. to get them a good deal. They don't tell you about vibrant Gujarat. None of that. They'll tell you about their spiritual work, how they do yoga. Ramdev is their advisor, this, that and the other thing. So the spirituality on the one side and entrepreneurship, you know, uh, the idea of philanthropy, this becomes a very important thing. In our culture, the idea of people as citizens begins to devolve and the idea of people as potential entrepreneurs begins to increase. That takes up much more cultural space. So in films, in television shows, etc., entrepreneurialism is promoted. You know, families, the importance of the family, slash spirituality, tradition in other words, and then self-help, I'm going to improve myself, I'm going to do better, this time I'm going to do a good job, you know, that kind of thing in television shows. I'm that child who previously wasn't doing a good job, now I'm going to do a good job. So for the rest of the season you see this person, then everybody's anxious, they may not succeed, but they could succeed. And that's the only path forward. Citizenship, community, these concepts get emptied out. And the concept of the entrepreneur gets filled in. So neoliberalism, which we understand basically as privatization, commodification, all, all that is true. The cultural aspect is equally important. Now, neoliberalism utterly fails to solve the crisis. Because what we see is that systemic risk is still borne by the millions of people who find either useless work, drudge, routine, boring work. Even those who attain high level degrees end up finding themselves doing drudge work. So you have people, PhD in oncology, in a biological outsourcing place in Bangalore, where what they're doing is they're doing a little piece of research, which is not for their own career or their own project. They are getting outsourced sections of research from a pharmaceutical company in Switzerland. That's, that research is patented. There are six different labs in Bangalore doing the same piece of research because they don't want to waste their time because they're stuck at that point. So they say there are six ways you can go. Let six of you do the research. Who succeeds, we get the research back. Those who fail, well, we'll give you something else to do. Meanwhile, there's no knowledge built here. They are patenting the knowledge and controlling it. And people here are making reasonably high salaries for the Indian labor market. But they don't have a career. They're basically drudge workers. 
The gap between a call center worker and a biological outsourcing worker is minimum in terms of the fact that there's no development of your brain happening. You're basically doing drudge labor. So neoliberalism doesn't succeed in producing decent jobs or a good society. It just might increase wages for some people, you know, in, because of labor arbitrage, wage arbitrage. So when this fails, there are great anxieties developing in these po populations. The main anxiety, main political anxiety that develops is among white collar workers. And I just want to stay with that in, for a second. In the United States, to give you just as an example, the major political distress in the last 10 years has not been among blue collar workers. See, blue collar workers lost their jobs 30, 35 years ago. Manufacturing in the United States started to decline from the 1960s. You know, factories have been shut for 20, 30, 40 years. 10, 15 years ago, the major blow to the American economy in terms of jobs was for white collar workers, not the white working class. You know, the media explains the Trump phenomena as being the white working class going for Trump. But if you look at the statistics, much of the white working class continue to vote Democratic. The economic uh, data is interesting from exit polls. That actually the Democrats won the lower section of income earners. It's the middle section of income earners, white middle section of income, that went for the Republicans. Who are these people? These people are people who used to work in business processing units, in large office parks in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in, you know, uh, in Colorado. The, these are people who live just outside in suburban communities, mainly all white communities. Uh, where they worked on things like back office for pharmaceutical companies, for insurance companies, etc. Those sectors have globalized. That's what we call not business processing, but business process outsourcing. They moved to Ireland, they moved to India, and as you see now, they are moving to China, they are moving to Malaysia, etc. So that sector lost its jobs. These are people isolated from cities, many of them. Here the racism is quite acute, and I'm going to come back to anti-Indian racism, because you might find this particularly interesting. So this section was the Tea Party from 2010. The first Tea Party protests don't happen in working class parts of cities or working class parts of rural areas. The first Tea Parties happen in suburbs among white collar workers. I mean, the language of the class in the United States is very underdeveloped. So when people say working class or workers, those words are just not used that much. I mean, everybody is middle class. So the language of class, so people's specificity sometimes gets foggy. You know, you hear the media struggling to talk about class. Many of these people have never studied the question of class seriously. You know, uh, because the assumption has been for years that there's no real workers in, in America. It's just everybody is middle class. So this white collar uh, class of workers who were fired and therefore genuine victims of globalization uh, became tinder in a sense for Trump. It's the same class in Turkey uh, that played a major role for Erdogan, not the main role. Main role for Anatolian business people, small businesses, etc. You know, uh, disgruntled people in the big cities who had issues where their religious piety was suppressed. They moved very strongly for the AKP party. But you know, the real group that put them over the edge were these lower middle class workers who were finding their livelihoods squashed by globalization. You know, because they are the people whose jobs were the easiest to globalize. In other words, people who work in offices, uh, banging on computers, doing database work, etc. Because that's routine stuff that you can send elsewhere and through satellite communication and computers, it's very easy to get rid of those jobs. The age of anger is rooted there. But who do they get angry at? You see, there was a study done in Ohio which showed that 88% of American job loss in the last 15 years was because of productivity gains and machines, mechanization. You know, and we know that in our lives all over the world. You know, how when you get computers, you become much more productive. Your leisure actually decreases because you start working all the time. You know, the gap between work and pleasure begins to fade for most people. You know, your phone rings in, late in the night and it's work. There was no way to hide from work. So the working day has begun to expand for some people, for certain side. I don't have time to get into that. But the important point that I want to make is that uh, productivity gains and mechanization were the actual problem, but the real reason why there's been a massive global jobs crisis. It's very hard if you're from the neoliberal or extreme center to critique productivity gains. They don't have an answer to that. 
their answer always to people is you can go and take a coaching class and maybe you'll make it. You know, they don't have a jobs program because they don't want to attack the general strike of the rich, take some of their wealth and create a government-run jobs program. They're not willing to do that. So they have no answer to your joblessness. The extreme right or the cruel populace have a very clear answer for joblessness. What they say is, we know your jobs are gone. We know your situation is bad. They don't deny it. The neoliberals often deny it. We know your jobs are, are gone. But instead of taking on the full implications of the productivity problem, they blame somebody else. And in the United States, the Trump phenomena has led to the blaming of three specific communities. What he had called Mexican rapists, in other words, so-called illegal immigrants or undocumented workers or undocumented people who came across the border, so what he called Mexican rapists, Islamic or Muslim terrorists, or extreme Islamic radicalism, okay, that group, which is also bewildering because the percentage of Muslims who come from outside the United States is not uh, that significant. I mean, there are a considerable number of American-born Muslims. Many of them are African-American Muslims, but still. And then in there, there's a subsection of refugees who are coming in who might be a problem because the right has linked immigration to terrorism very considerably. This is not just in the United States. This is most in, in most of Europe. So this is the second lot. Now, it's not clear what job loss has to do with um, the entry of terrorists into the country, but I guess it's a life loss might be an anxiety. But the third is very interesting, and this is the H-1B visa. Now, in a, a radio show that uh, Trump did with his advisor to be, he wasn't yet his advice, Steve Bannon, uh, they talked about H-1B. But Bannon said these Indians are the worst people. He said they come here, they don't have what he called Jefferson democracy in their DNA. That was a phrase he used, very harsh language against Indians. In, Trump initially tried to say, I like Indians, they're so smart, they help the economy grow, etc. But then slowly over the year 2013, 14, he began to agree with Bannon. And then on the campaign trail in Ohio and other states, he would give these fear, fiery speeches against the H-1B program. That was the visa program that allowed Indians and others into the country if they had certain skills. In these states grew these vigilante groups that would walk around with video cameras following Indians around, harassing them essentially, and saying, look at them, they don't make friends with anybody, etc. I mean, vicious stuff. Now, what was interesting, by the way, as a side note, is the Indian media didn't report any of this. You know, the only two stories that I know in the Indian media, I wrote a story in Frontline about this, and Vergis George, my colleague at the Hindu, wrote a story on this in the Hindu. That was it. None of the TV channels, even though there's incredible visual material, used any of this. So, the right wing quite correctly identifies there's a jobs problem. But rather than have a humane policy to deal with it, they attack vulnerable populations. That's the age of anger. The left, much weakened in this period, hasn't actually come up with a fully articulated solution to what I think is a permanent so-called jobs crisis. Now, it's true. In the moment, we have to defend against job loss. That's true. You know, hemorrhaging of jobs, firing of people, because these are genuinely real livelihoods at stake. At the same time, I would recommend that we start thinking beyond this economy. You know, after all, if I'm somebody who's a Marxist, I'm not committed to solving capitalism's problems. I'm interested in going beyond capitalism. I have to visualize what a beyond capitalism would look like. I mean, in the future society, because of productivity gains, we should enjoy the free time we get. After all, the eight-hour day movement of the May Day workers, they said eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and eight hours of what you will. Marx in the German ideology writes about looking forward to the time when you can fish in the morning, read a book in the afternoon, go for a walk in the evening, do other things, meet people, you know, have community lives, build community spaces, you know, use instead of having prisons, make them into community centers, art spaces, have more theater, enjoy life the way we should with freedom. Jobs is not why we are here on earth. We are here on earth to build society. We are social animals. So as socialists, as Marxists, we need to think about and, and envision a future society. This is why culture is such an important domain for us. Culture should allow us not only to reflect the age of anger. Terrible things are happening, so I'm going to write a poem which reflects that. Terrible things are happening, so I'm going to do a play that reflects that. 
J.G. Ballard, I'm going to end with this. J.G. Ballard, the great writer, interesting writer, once said that in a capitalist system, in our system, it's easier to imagine the end of the earth than to imagine the end of capitalism. In other words, films are made of, you know, aliens coming in and eating people up or the planet blowing up or things like that. You can easily imagine the planet ripped in half, lava coming out, some monstrous beast coming and devouring us. But you can't allow ourselves to imagine the end of capitalism. It's a very peculiar problem we face. This system has stopped us from imagining a future. We're stuck in the present. So if we want to actually fight and get through the age of anger, the answer isn't just to fight them on their terms, but to imagine a different future. Thanks a lot. questions together. So please, but a little louder because the fan is noisy. Yeah. Um, so the question is, in the context of what I said, what do you what role do you see for the Bretton Woods institutions, such as the IMF, the World Bank, etc.? Well, the IMF and the World Bank were created after World War II with the express purpose of preventing a major capitalist crisis which would lead to fascism. I mean, the, 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 the theory for the IMF was if a country suffered a short-term liquidity crisis, the IMF would come in and stop the spiral into inflationary times and therefore fascism. The IMF, without actually a democratic process, changed its mission. Its mission now is basically to come in as a lever and change and break down democratic sovereignty of nation. Correct? What's interesting is as we enter this age of multipolarity, as the Chinese and Russians are reasserting themselves in whatever you know small way, and the BRICS block has emerged again unevenly, because the BRICS block relies on the leadership, the class character of the leadership in each of these countries. So when Brazil had a left-leaning leader, then Brazil played a different role in BRICS. Now Brazil has a right-leaning leader, different class characteristics of the leadership. BRICS is also a different group. But anyway, they were interested in starting new parallel institutions, new kinds of development bank, new kinds of contingency financing institutions. They're very boringly named. Okay, I thought the International Monetary Fund is a much better name than contingency financing institution or whatever it was called. Those have not taken off, partly because the financial problems of some of these countries, including China, have been quite acute. So they're not willing to put their resources into building them up. I mean, in a future society, if we have, if we make our arrangements across community grounds, you know, we may not need such large institutions as nation states. You know, I look forward to the future time when we have much more decentralized power, where our understanding of how we relate to each other for trade is much more equitable. You know, you can see shadows of that. For instance, when the Bolivarian area of the Americas was created in South America, in Central America, the Caribbean, they created interesting mechanisms to trade. You know, for instance, the Venezuelans provided Cuba with oil, and the Cubans provided Venezuela with doctors. And they found an equitable mechanism to judge how many doctors for how much oil. Now, you might say, well, this is a return to barter. It's not a return to barter. Because it's the new system after the market. In other words, we, barter is an old system. Nobody is saying, let's return to barter. Now we understand how market signals work and don't work. So we can use the knowledge we have of the some successes of market systems, some failures, to develop a new system of trade. Why should we help? Why should we be held back by today's system of trade? We should be imaginative, speculative. I mean, we're human beings after all. We find answers and solutions to things. Scientists don't get blocked with failure is an impetus to do something new. Correct? If your experiment fails, you don't say, well, that's it, now I'm going home, I'm depressed. Okay, maybe that happens one day two days, three days, the next time, next week you're back trying something new. So why is it that when we think of financial things or money, every time anybody says, let's try something new, they'll, well, that's idealistic. 
Why is that unrealistic? The system has failed. You know, countries are in endemic crisis. Single commodity producing countries can't break out of it. There is a finance development trap. Those countries that are poor have to borrow money at very expensive rates. Those countries that are rich borrow money at very low rates. That seems bizarre to me. That's what I consider the finance development trap. The system is not working. Why can't we be creative, you know? So don't allow yourself to be, as it were, put down by the statement that you're being too idealistic. What's wrong with being idealistic? I mean, you know, I'm a 50-year-old man, and I really don't care to be told that I'm too old to be idealistic. It's okay for young people, you know? That's ridiculous. You know, the world is ahead of us. If we don't put our knowledge and experience, if we don't listen to other people, take risks to change the world, why live in a world that's not working? Hello. So, um, I really enjoy the talk. Um, so, um, I personally feel right now that uh, we are in the late stage of capitalism. I mean, this is just my, uh, this is what I hope at least. Uh, what do you think about uh, that and then how do you tie that tied it up with the ecological crisis which capitalism is inducing right now? And right. You know, one of the, I think, limitations of earlier socialist and communist experiments was that the full implications of the ecological crisis wasn't understood. You know, maybe in our new horizon that we have to build, build we have to rethink how we live. Now, it's of course true that this is highly uneven across the boundaries of imperialism. You know, I mean, in sections of the West, resource use is so vast so much beyond what people in places like India use, where 760 million people live in deprivation, that to talk about some equal idea where everybody has to reduce use is ridiculous. And you know where Paris, the Paris Accords were about balancing everybody's use downward, you know, that everybody had to contribute to the mitigation, which I think is a strange idea because there's such unevenness. You know, they say that in, in if everybody lived in the way the United States live, we need how many planets? Only eight. I thought it was more than eight planets. That it's not possible to live on the planet Earth if everybody became American in resource use. So obviously there has to be immense pressure on the West to reconsider its resource use. You know, there's just too much, too many resources being used. I'll give you a stupid example, okay? Maybe you'll, you'll think it's a stupid one, but listen to this example. Let's say you live in Chicago, Illinois, where for most of the winter it's freezing outside. Okay, so it's freezing outside. I understand that you need to build a house or an apartment with heat. That's understandable. People will freeze outside. You may say, don't live there. Well, that's okay, you live there. Put the heat on. Now, inside this heated apartment, you place a refrigerator, which is now cooling against the heat, which is heating against the cold. So this is the first odd thing. Why not produce a shelving system just outside your apartment? You know, you can have a lock on it so animals don't get to it. Or make a cage around it or something. Please. But no. Pardon? It's not my spots. Have exactly, exactly. But wait, it gets more absurd. So, you know, so now you have a cold box which is fighting against the heat of the apartment, which is fighting against the immense cold outside. Then inside the freezer, in the old days, when you bought a freezer, you would buy an ice pick. Because the freezer used to freeze over, so you'd have to pick at it. To get at your, you, you may remember this in the old boxes we'd get, you'd get an ice pick. Those are not available anymore because now inside the freezer section there is a heating coil. So wait a minute. <laughs> so you have a heating coil inside the freezer section that's working against the freezing section, that's working against the heat in the house, that's working against the cold, natural cold outside. Now tell me if this is a logical and rational way to live as humans on the earth. No, I mean definitely I agree with you. This is why I said we are heading for an ecological crisis as well. But where do you see that transition happening? Capitalism is driving the world into an ecological crisis. But once that hits, what what well, sort of a if it hits, we are finished. <laughs> I mean, you know that. Quote from Ballard is, I close my introduction in the book with the flask slip through the asphalt. I close it with that quote. 
I mean, it's true. We should imagine the end of the earth because it may happen. I don't, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen. It may happen. For people in the South Sea Islands, it's already happened. Three islands have already vanished. Now, people move to other islands, but homelands are going to disappear. Bangladesh may disappear, etc. And we're being extraordinarily callous about it. So this is already happening. But I don't think the solution is possible within a productivist capitalist model. We need to think about new models. We need to fight. We need to be very imaginative and bold. Not be tentative when we talk to people. That doesn't mean we have to yell at people and things like that. But we need to say there are other ways to do things. And this refrigerator example I'm giving you, it's a practical thing. Put, as you say quite rightly, create an icebox. In, if you don't want everything to freeze, you can have a pantry space which is mediating between the in and out where you put another box, right? Which is less cold than the exact outside. So you don't have things freeze. By the way, even things in the fridge, if they freeze, they, they will defrost quite rapidly. Or don't buy so many things from the grocery store. Go and walk to the shop more often, you'll be healthier. Then you won't have to go on diets. You won't have to have vast places for exercise where you have to drive there to exercise. You know, that's a new absurd thing which has hit the planet. I'm going to get into my car, drive five, six miles to my exercise place. Why don't you just walk six miles and walk back six or twelve miles? No, I have to drive that way. I mean, we have gone insane as a, as a human uh, society. So we should challenge these things, not passively take them as normal. They are not normal. To my mind, they are bizarre. Yes. I heard it. coming up with a new currency system. You know, that's an illusion. I mean, Marx had great essays arguing against the Fourierists, you know, the, the, the utopian socialists. Just by coming up with a new system of currency, these are fantasies. Like, you know, Fourier came up with the chit system. We'll have chits. That's like Bitcoin online. Chits online is Bitcoin. I mean, these are interesting ways of dealing with transactions. But they're not going to solve the underlying problems. I mean, how is Bitcoin going to solve the problem of climate change. It's not. You know, and the issue isn't the dollar itself. It's the role the dollar plays against other currencies, as the universal currency, etc. You know, it's the way in which when the dollar is shifted by its Federal Reserve for domestic reasons, it has international impact. So it's not democratic how the dollar works as an international currency. So you, when the United States government or the Federal Reserve decides outside the government that it's time to raise interest rates through the London interbank offer rate that's going to affect Indian commercial banking. So why not have an international currency perhaps, if we, I don't believe that a new currency changes everything, but have an international UN based currency or some kind of currency which is democratically decided in terms of, you know, you have an internationally based committee, I don't know how we would organize it. But where it's movement up and down, you have to think about everybody's currency. They might be, or make it regional. Again, the Bolivarians created the Sucre, which was their regional currency for inter, you know, Bolivarian area trade. I gotta to go to somebody else. So there are ways in which you can think about these things. I don't think new currency methods solve things. They don't change the underlying, you know, basis of accumulation, globalization, etc. Yes. Uh, and you, then there. you gave an example of how the uh, uh, laborers don't have uh, access to go to the uh, markets for higher wages. Mm -hmm. But isn't uh, capitalism is also one of the ways which is uh, like creating uh, uh, more jobs than the other. Like example in Bangladesh, the garment workers, had it not been for the Nike shoes, their living standards would have been much more worse. So like there are uh, successful entrepreneurs who thought otherwise, but they ended up coming to capitalism as a way of creating and ha having better standards of life. 
So what is your opinion on that? And second, no, and well, I, let's do one because yeah, they so have questions. It is just end. interlinked. Like even if there's something new comes up, there's always this uh, idea of people looking everything at the religious point of view. So will that would stand up? That is my question. That's like, the second question. Yeah. Anyways, let me ask you a first question and then let them have a go. Uh, no, right there behind. You. The first question is, you know, capitalism produces some jobs in that uneven topography. You know, if you leave your campus and go for a walk, you see a human being going into a drain to clean the drain. It's illegal in India and there's good technologies to have that human being not do that job. But if I said to you, I want to abolish drain cleaning completely because I think it's dehumanizing. I think it's the most casteist, disgusting thing you see on Indian streets. You'll say, well, at least it's a job. And I say, any job is not a job. People's existence is not to be degraded to earn money. If I show you pictures of children in Surat polishing diamonds, going blind at age 20, you might say, well, at least they're bringing some income to their homes. It's illegal child labor. But I say, that's not a job. That's a deg degradation of a child. In the same way, garment workers in Bangladesh, yes, they have an income coming in, but those are not jobs. That's a degradation of humanity. They go into work, factories collapse on them, they work extremely long hours, there's no time for, to breathe, there's no time to be a human being. They don't have any money to go for a concert, they don't have time to spend doing their art. You know, human beings deserve more in their lives than working 15 hours a day in a factory or a maquila dora. You know, there are women studies of women workers in, in, in Shenzhen, in China, committing suicide, you know, going mad. There was a great book called Made in China which looked at women workers who had nightmarish Just dreams. Nets. They put nets in Foxconn to catch the people committing suicide. This is not work, my friend. Just because you're earning some income doesn't mean you're, you have a job or what the ILO calls decent work. What you have is you've sold your body to be degraded mm -hmm. by capital so that commodities can come on the shelves which you can never buy. That's not a job. Don't mistake going somewhere and earning money for a job. Yeah. Uh, which is the hemorrhaging of jobs within the IT sector right now. Um, and my question is, um, so how do you interpret the relevance of this with vis-a-vis -vis Indian political economy more generally? You see it as a tiny enclave um, economy that produces relatively few number of jobs for an elite workforce, so it's not that relevant to those who don't work in the IT industry, or do you see it as some kind of greater rupture? So I'd say, I'll answer this in two ways. The first way is that sadly, Indian social science has failed to study the political economy of India. We don't get enough PhDs written about new developments in Indian political economy. Studies of the IT sector, serious studies of what is the accumulative value produced by the IT sector for Indian GDP. Serious academic studies. We don't have studies of that workforce from Madras to Coimbatore, the new factories, the Hyundai factories, etc. Who's doing those studies? Even Manesar, the factory, the Maruti factory, where is the good book on the political economy of these factories? We don't have them. I don't know what Indian social science is producing. We at Leftward have looked for years for people who are doing serious empirical studies about contemporary Indian capitalism. Mm. So I say this because I don't really know how to answer your question. But what I do know is that there's such a great hype about the importance of IT to the Indian economy when we all know that it's, a, as you said, a minuscule percentage of the workforce, but a significant percentage of college graduates. You know, that's an important feature. This is a section of the population that is able to be the mirror of what the bourgeoisie wants to see as India. In other words, 780 million Indians live in deprivation, but they have become irrelevant. If you can now show that the middle class has moved, or this section has moved to live a certain lifestyle, and there's some way to aspire to that, then they can measure success. In other words, success in India now is not measured by ending hunger for every Indian, 1.3 billion Indians. Success is measured by if college graduates can get an upwardly mobile job. That seems to me a very middle class understanding of a nation's success. So these firings have been, I think, quite traumatic. Because people are thinking, oh my God, you know, in India, what is happening to India's success? 
But I could put it to you, starvation deaths, mass suicide in the countryside, Telangana, you know, some of our CPIM comrades are on a padyatra feeding people. Where is the anxiety about that? You know, those starvation deaths that Sainath revealed in Anandpur and, you know, uh, Vidarbha, etc. Over a decade ago, that should have made people anxious that the political economy is failing. But who cares about 760 you know, or so billion Indians? It's when these 150,000 were laid off that the entire illusion, the magic, the facade began to fall. So I can't answer your question, but all I can say is it's depressing that those stories hit the front page and make us feel like, oh my God, now there's a problem in the economy. How strange. Question and maybe that's the last question. Okay, yeah, please. I have a question to both of you, maybe. Yeah. Please. Okay. I'll just speak. I think everyone can hear me. It's a small one. Uh, you've been doing street theater for many, many years. And what are the changes that you see in the way you are approaching it if you are seeing it from 2014 onwards? Is there I'm just curious, is there more of a hesitation to be more vocal? How open is it? Is that being thwarted on a day to day basis for artists like you? Well, I mean, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is uh, I think there's a, there's a difference in which a lot of street theatre groups uh, are thinking a little bit more carefully about what they can openly say. And I think it's it's unfortunate that they are having to do that. But, you know, it is also happening. On the other hand, uh, there are many, many instances, like in Delhi University, for instance, um, I regularly see street theatre being produced by students uh, in the university. And uh, a lot of that street theatre also is under attack from the Hindu right. You know, they come and shut down festivals and so on. And a lot of that theatre that I see is extraordinary in, in the boldness with which these young people are willing to, sp to speak up. Sometimes the boldness is not even in, in, in what they are saying necessarily. So like for instance, there is a play that I saw recently uh, from Gargi College uh, in Delhi University and uh, it's a women's college. Um, and uh, the play was basically saying, look, if we say that Kashmir and the North East are integral parts of India, then what does that mean? Does it not mean that the people in those places are also integral parts of India? And if that is the case, then are we willing to listen to them or not? Right? It's a plea for dialogue. It's a plea to just listen, hear what they are saying. Now that's the content of the play. The play was called Mera Naam, Mera Naam Kashmir or Aap Main Manipur. Right. Now, it's a beautiful title, right? but the title is what got the Hindu right agitated. You know, if they, and, and I'm conflicted about this. I don't know how to sort this out. If they had kept a title that did not let on, if the title didn't have Kashmir and Manipur in the, the, you know, in the title, would they have been attacked? I mean, they weren't attacked physically. But, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they tried to stop uh, a festival at which they wanted to perform it. But the content of the play was not saying Azadi, Azadi or anything of that kind. You know, the content was just saying, listen to each other, that's all. Right? But there are other plays that are incredibly bold in what they say. Sometimes they name Modi, they name, you know, Amit Shah, etc which is really, really brave and bold of them to do so. But has it affected your spirit, let's say, in that sense? That is it something that makes you feel that it's your voice is being cut, so to say? Well, no, or I don't... Priya Josh, Jada Aa Jata Hai, how is your... I know it's not black and white, but what is the feeling that artists like you, as you are here, are Well, in our case, in the case of Janati Manch, it's... Uh, something that it's not as if oh you know we must be bold we must do this etc it's not that kind of bravado certainly not I think we've been around for too long to have a certain kind of bravado uh, we don't want to get bashed up we don't want to get you know our people 
uh, are actors you know injured or, or worse right that's not what we do theater for um, so therefore you know there's not that but on the other hand it's also equally true that we wouldn't be cowed down uh, just because we fear that something might happen but of course one has to be clever one has to be inventive one has to be you know like in the in the play that i spoke to you about the guru the name is guru bol gango and buddhibali and bahubali and the rss is never mentioned in the play you know modi is not mentioned in the play amit shah is not mentioned in the play none of that is mentioned and it's funny you know it makes people laugh really so you know you have to use these clever ways of, of winning the audience over to your side and say things sometimes through innuendo not naming but suggesting not sexual innuendo that's not the only kind of innuendo that exists we really use um, you know shorthand etc etc a lot of those sorts of things um, okay last question because we really have to get to our next talk yes please How many in the audience really get the point? Get this meaning uh, at those that you suggest because it looks like often many plays. When whenever I uh, even watch plays with my cousins and you know, the very middle class people, these things fall flat. In fact, they they blind to all these things. They are not very. You know, so it's not to say that they are not sensible enough to understand these things. But then when things do not are not said directly, really do they? get across or do they watch it as another entity well uh, the way i look at it is that nothing that you do will be understood 100% in exactly the same way as you had imagined it no art works like that never you know uh, so that's one part of the answer but the other more important part of the answer is to say that that's exactly that 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 you have to understand the context of of the performance itself the performance is not a stand alone thing the performance is not something that people see make sense of understand not understand use it not use it and go away no we are working with organizations and our experience is that whenever there are creative organizations i mean by creative i mean trade union organizations that are creative in their work or you know women's organization stroom dog name you know whatever that are creative in their work they use these plays to generate discussion and debate and that's incredibly useful so so it sets off something it's not necessary for everybody to understand everything as long as there's a conversation that can begin and then a whole lot of people take part in that conversation not just the person who watches it sure have to be creative uh, i can give you examples and so on but we, you know we don't really have the time the the essential point is you have to be creative if you look at advertisements for instance you know there are studies that that say how many times an advertisement of 10 seconds has to be seen by people in order for them to register what is happening in the ad and this is something all of us have gone through we see an ad for the first time and we say eh what was that that was interesting but what exactly happened what did that person say to that what was the product being advertised what was the story of this advertisement and you see it four five six times in order to even understand what's happening <coughs> then for the message to register and then for it to be turned into action and going and buying a product etc is a whole different issue in street theater we don't have that in street theater our audiences watch our play once and they only for the first time and they only watch it once in those 20 minutes 15 minutes 25 minutes whatever it is through a live performance we have to touch something mm. you know and that that touch that contact is a human contact it's not some technology that is 
beaming down on you, bombarding you with images, etc., etc., etc. In fact, in some ways, the fact that we are totally non-technological in our theatre works, in fact, to our advantage mm. because people stop and you know listen. It's I, I don't want to romanticize this too much. I don't want to say everybody is always enthralled by what we do. No, absolutely not. But I think it happens enough times for people to feel a sense of connection, you know, for people to come back to us and say, oh, you know, that thing that you showed was really good. They don't talk about the whole thing, you know, but, ji, wo bada achcha laga, wo aapne sahi baat dekha hai, mere saath bhi aise hua tha. Something, some connection, and that's all you really need. All you need is a conversation to begin, really. Three quick announcements. Please. First one is yeah. that the reason we have to go is we have an event at the Jamun at 7.30 uh, on the Indian left and its future. And uh, I, I have the address but I can't read it. It's called Fuzzy. But it's the Jamun somewhere. There's a Jamun tree in front of it. If you walk around Bangalore and see a Jamun tree, <laughs> I guess it's inside R &B, there. It's an RMV. RMV, okay. Uh, I can only read 521, second main, third block, r &B. Okay, good. Number two, uh, please, if you have ideas for books, if you have problems with our books, uh, if you want us to write, you know, publish different books, if you see something on Indian political economy that interests you, write to Sudhanwa at sudhanwa at leftward.com or write to me at vijay at leftward.com. That's the second announcement. We really want to hear from you because, you know, we are not a capitalist publishing house. We rely on our readers. We need to get lectured by our readers because we want to learn from you. You know, we are not producing things and giving it to you as a commodity. We want you to participate with us in producing books. Finally, we have books which you haven't participated in producing yet. But uh, Sudhanwa, I mean, as Suvendu said, we have uh, discounts of between 30 and 50 percent. And some of our most expensive books, they are going for 50% off. So please go have a look and uh, hope to see you at the Jamun. Okay.